Well, it's mostly the 1980s that I was, that where I was working here. I actually found Open Studio through, um, I think, the Yellow Pages, to be honest. I was always aware of uh, Open Studio from the time I arrived in 1975, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> I did a residency in, it must have been later in the 80s actually, that was Rita McCo who was the person assisting me at the time. Uh, but even before then, uh, when we started Chromosome, a gallery artist run center that only lasted for five years, we never intended to be permanent. One of our, our members, Tony Wilson, was a printmaker and had worked here. And, was a good friend of Barbara Hall's who, until I read later about her, I uh, read her biography afterwards, uh, I didn't even know she was one of the founders of the gallery. And uh, so uh, I did a residency. I'd done two prints where I've actually hired uh, master printers to in silk screening to make prints. And uh, after that, I kind of moved, Those I started doing the same things in digital prints, but uh, they have a different quality as, as, uh, as uh, silk screens and that I like. They still look quite different. It was a very disjointed, eclectic, and very exciting place. I came from Ottawa, so that kind of sounds like everything should be exciting, but, uh, but it was, and it was a great learning place for me. There was, um, uh, um, a very, uh, there were a lot of big personalities and it was a very macho culture. And at the center of that was Don Holman. And Don was um, someone who um, loved to teach. So he was always bringing people in. He was a great storyteller. And he brought in a lot of artists. Um, he trained a lot of people as master printers. But um, uh, the thing that I remember from, those, er, from that early decade, which really taught me a lot, was how he, wor how he worked with Harold Klunder. And Harold Klunder was kind of an aristocrat. Like, he never got dirty. He never, he never um, uh, did, got involved in any of the process. He just saved all his attention for, the, for making the mark on the stone. So whether it was with a brush, whether it was a crayon, when it was his turn to make the mark, he was totally focused. And I, I kind of learned that when you're making work, everything matters. And so um, I, I just felt that was a very important lesson. And a lot of the work that he did, it's, it's, um, there's, there's many, many layers. And it was a real privilege to see how the different layers were, were made and how each layer itself was beautiful. Like you really wish there could have been state proofs from every stage. Um, so that was, that was one of my early memories and learning experiences at Open Studio. Well, in the late 80s when I came in, I was kind of stunned <laughs> when I came here because uh, I was just starting out and I wanted to learn everything so I tried all the different disciplines um, litho was not for me I knew that right away but but I really focused on etching and silkscreen and within those areas there were all these different groups of artists like really good friends who were working together or people working alone but but what I noticed was that so many young artists already had a vision that they were following. And so, you know, in this whole giant studio, and it was really packed in those days, they weren't put off by somebody doing something different. They, they would have been influenced by them in some way, like a particular use of color or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, so I was a little bit in shock for a couple of years. So I was just very, quietly kind of trying to figure out what it is I like and, and where am I going to go with, with a, a developing vision that I had of, of work that I wanted to do. And people were incredibly generous. That's what I discovered was that no matter what area I was in, 
they're always there to help because I, I hadn't been trained in printmaking, so I was just learning on, on the job, basically. And um, people like Doug Guilford, I, I worked with him, beside him in silk screen, and you know he would show me different bases to use, like technical stuff, and then we just had such a great time. Like he always came in every fall because he was getting ready for his, his uh, Christmas, he had a Christmas sale every year in his studio. And, and he was making calendars. And the images on the calendars were just fabulous. And so, you know, he was just a wonderful person. And also in screen, although I rarely saw her, was Julie Voice, because she worked at night. So she had a day job and then she, she would come in late in the afternoon and work through the night. But the evidence of her work was always there because she was so energetic. So in the morning when I'd come in, all the racks would be <laughs> stacked with her work, and it was, it was phenomenal stuff. She was amazing. It really started to thaw out. It was kind of frozen into little cliques when I first arrived. And uh, by the end of the 70s, there was a big influx of artists from Montreal, uh, artists even Calgary, not many artists came here from Calgary actually, but uh, even Calgary all of a sudden you'd see artists coming from there, from uh, the West Coast, from people arriving from NASCAD. So things changed uh, really, uh, really a lot in that period. And uh, so, and in the 80s it was quite an exciting thing because uh, there were all sudden kind of venues where you could meet other people. It wasn't so clear before. I mean, there was the Beverly that had the new wave bands and the punk bands, but uh, uh, so there was the Cameron and there was uh, the Cabana Room in Spadina Hotel. So you got a chance to meet the people and there was also less kind of, of streaming of types of artists. So you were hanging out with clothing designers and musicians. And, so it was kind of a renaissance in that period. Yeah. Well, it was also really incredibly active. Like the artists were meeting in, in pubs and, and um, there were a lot of parties going on, artist parties and um, there were all kinds of events, happenings, they were called then. And, and so people weren't invited individually, but the whole community would be invited. Um, there was great theater and great music going on and I had moved from Winnipeg so that has a great music scene too but but uh, not like what was happening here you know going to Grossman's Tavern or, or to El Macombo so and artists were always doing that so you could work the whole day in the studio and then people would say oh let's let's go for a drink let's go for dinner and and that would happen so then what, when I got to know the artists and sort of where, where they were existing outside of, of the studio, I was able to go to galleries, like up and coming galleries and, and storefronts and, and see their names and kind of watch, watch. I learned from them tremendously how you get a show together, how you, you get a group of people to, to take a, a raw space and create this whole beautiful exhibition area. So there were some fantastic shows that were going on that, that some of the people at Open Studio were involved in, but they were connected to other people who were not printmakers, but were sculptors and, and uh, painters and drawers and all kinds of people. So, so really the crux of it was that for me it started at Open Studio, but then there were all these fingers that went into the broader community. And, it was just um, a heady time. It was less expensive to work, to live. So people worked from early morning, like put in eight, 10 hour days, and people worked like at least five days a week, it seemed to me. So it was a different kind of commitment. And we could afford to make that commitment because rent was less. You know, it's interesting how economics play a huge part in all that. Well, I, I hadn't seen them in decades and decades, and 
Some artists, of course, have continued and others I'd forgotten about. And it was really wonderful to revisit the work. And actually, when I, I would look at a work, say, by Harriet Wolfe, it would remind me that, oh yeah, she used to sit in the corner of the studio and just very quietly do these incredibly detailed, obsessive scapes in her work. And um, she was just a quiet person, worked very differently from, from other people who were out there. And, and so it really brought back all kinds of memories and um, some sad because the people have, have passed on. And, um, and others, it was just really wonderful. And some I, I didn't know about that, you know, I wasn't there all the time. And, and so artists were c coming in and out and producing work. Um, they were visiting artists all the time who wouldn't have been at the studio except for a, a limited time. And, and to see their work and, and actually look at the work as a whole of how does it represent that decade. That was fascinating because you can't say overall, you know, this was the 80s, this is what the 80s looked like. Uh, there certainly were aspects of it, but I think overall from a printmaking perspective, I had the feeling that it was experimentation gone wild that we were all trying to get away from and encouraged to get away from traditional editioning and just try, you know, one, one type of, of discipline on top of another. And it really didn't matter. So, so, I mean, it mattered to your vision. If that worked for you, that was great and you, were, and you could do it. So um, I, I was really uh, drawn to the experimentation aspect which I ended up doing in my own work, where I would layer drawings and then on top of that do either silk screen or etchings and then hand coloring on top of that and, and just call them varied editions. You know, there was, there was a place for these things in the print world as well. It was great, it was great. Um, you know, there, it gave me a bigger perspective on what was happening. There were artists whose work I really liked, who I would have liked to have known about in the 80s because we would have could have shown them at chromosome chromosome we did group shows and they were very eclectic and we can kind of scandalize them the modernists by doing salon hanging and just cramming so much into the space so that be, because there was such a need for a new generation of artists to be seen but uh so um but also you know it's like when in movies that are kind of naive and uh, they do 1963 and all the cars are from 1960s and there's no old cars on the streets where in actuality there were cars. So I was reviewing, you also saw the like aesthetics from previous times that were coming to fore in the 80s that still lingered at the time. Um, I found it kind of uh, um, a slightly um like a quasi melancholy responsibility, you know, to go through and, and look at work uh, because you, you feel like this is somebody's life work. So it seemed very, like a very serious responsibility. Uh, but I know that you need to, um, that editing process has to happen. Uh, to be brutally honest, in our own lives, if we don't edit our work, uh, we will die and the uh, unfortunate, overwhelmed person who inherits, inherits everything that we leave uh, will probably save a few of the worst examples and throw everything in the dumpster. Like, you have to edit, you can't, it's just too overwhelming. And you have to do it yourself or people that you entrust to care and make serious judgments. There was a lot of abstraction and kind of color field stuff, which I arrived in Toronto with a big uh, grudge against because my instructors were color field painters and, and some of them were really coercive about shoving us that way. So, uh, uh, and you know, I probably have a better, you know, I'm a little more objective looking at that stuff now and less resentment, let's say, uh, and things are so much less polemical now. I mean, people really took positions in the 80s and, and uh, you kind of, you know, you'd have, you'd go to the Cameron and be seated next to 
uh, people like Jan Poldes and you'd growl at them and have arguments and made snide comments to each other. 20 years later, you're all friends and it's like you respect them for, you know, Rick Evans, uh, Jan's no longer with us, but you respect them for keeping on working, still being there. There were a few, and um, one of them I had not heard. I, I, I'm assuming he was a visiting artist because he, he didn't work here, and that's Shenji uh, Funabashi. And his work was bright and graphic, which was happening in the 80s, but it was the colors were so fresh and, and uh, wonderful shapes, just really against a white background. It was really uh, crisp very, very crisp, clean colors. And I thought, yes, I do recall the 80s, things were coming out. And it was, to me, it was kind of, um, uh, it grew out of Matisse's paintings, out of his cutouts, his paper cutouts. And, and yet there was a difference. There wasn't, uh, there, there was still that awkwardness of, of the cut line, but this was a different way of, of making the line. They, they may have been cut, but, I think that it was more um, stencils that they were creating. Uh, but the colors were different and they were lighter and fresher and just this sense of exuberance that I really loved about his work. I wanted to mention two. One is Zenji Funabashi, uh, who I had never forgotten his work. It's very, there's a lot of like fresh air that moves through it. It's, uh, it's kind of as crisp as the day it was printed. But it, and it's so inventive, so sophisticated, such a light touch. Uh, it was just, it's not new to me, but it was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to see his work. But I, I also want to mention another artist, and that's Mary Lou Jones. And I had loved her work when I saw it. Um, and I thought that um, uh, um, I couldn't, well, I, I couldn't, she, she left, I think she went out west. So I, because I always, I was asking some of the print sales people, where can I find some of her work? I, I really wanted to buy one. And she kind of had disappeared. And the materials, it appeals to me on that level. Like there's very soft, very thin kind of wash effects so that it's almost iridescent. You can't really define the color, just like it's hard to say what is the color on the surface of a bubble but it glows and it glows with this inner warmth. And I think that inner warmth is, is uh, something that helps convey um, the sad kind of humanity at the center of her work. She did one piece of a, um, uh, a therapy circle and uh, the glow that you see on the surface is kind of like a, gl a unifying glow that you see um, among the people. Like you feel like it, it kind of, is a metaphor for the, um, the communion that they are sharing, whatever it is. It's it just uh, it, it's just the work has such um, kindness and poignancy, and uh, so you know that was a thrill to see that there. And I also thought, just to sort of circle back to that idea about editing, that. Um, uh, when you look through a collection, you wonder, like, why does some work well known? And why is some work not well known? And in her case, I kind of have to think it's, it's small scale, so it initially seems very modest and it might be overlooked. But, um, you know, if we were in a room of poets, we might overlook Emily Dickinson, you know. But uh, it makes me realize the importance of looking at a, at a large archive like Open Studios and looking at it uh, with fresh eyes and bringing new people in to reassess it. And after time when, you know, the big personalities kind of die down, like, well, what, what is here? What, what can we see with fresh eyes? And so the editing experience kind of allowed me to do that. The second artist who really um, came back to me after seeing the, the work in the 80s was Stanley Cochin. And Stanley, I worked right beside Stanley in the etching, um, and this was late 80s into the early 90s. Uh, 
Stanley died of AIDS, and I'm not sure of the year, I think it was 92, something like that, 92, 93. Uh, he was working in the studio when he already ha was HIV positive, and things were okay then for him physically. He, he wasn't in, in too much stress at the time, and he had a real caustic sense of humor. He was a really funny, lovely, lovely gentleman. Um, and the prints that he was doing then, it was always text-based. I think he did a few self-portraits, but, but the stronger work that he did was the text-based work. And they were really funny. And he often talked about God in his work and just thinking about the universe, but, but he had some very funny, funny things about uh, you know, creation was made on a budget, you know, that kind of thing, it was, it was great. Um, he started out with just line, line text, and then he moved into lino cuts, which gave a real three-dimensionality to, to the, the text itself, to each letter. And he started to work on very, quite large pieces that were packed with text, and he very, very carefully, and, and really with huge patience, just carved every letter very carefully in, in, uh, in a serif typeface. So there are a lot of little things that you have to be careful about not cutting through. He was, he was amazing that way. As he was making this, these pieces, uh, his disease got worse and worse. And he, he started to have psoriasis and, and uh, he started to get angry. And I see that in the work, like it brought it all back to me. He, he lived not far away from me, so he would often, when he was not feeling well, would ask me to bring tools from the studio that he needed. So I used to go to his place and um, physically he was really getting worse. And, um, and the work was getting very, very long and kind of a rant and very angry. And I think that absolutely shows what was happening then. When I thought about it, I thought that really seeing the, the assemblage of, of Julie Voices pieces, and uh, uh, she's an artist that's always been a little bit under the radar. That's, uh, you know, recently I've heard the, the AGO bought a number of her works, and I'm glad at that, but I also, wish that they would be more active in doing, I, you know, there's a list of longer than my arm of people who really deserve to have retrospectives at this point, and Julie's pretty close to the top of that list. And uh, uh, I kind of, when I was thinking about it today and, and what I looked at in thinking about Julie's, voice, Julie's work, I thought that in some ways she reminds me of, of Paul Clay, because I think maybe why Julie's been overlooked is because of the scale. She's always worked in kind of, if not an easel size scale, a desktop size scale. And as, as Clay did, you know, he, I've never seen a big clay piece, but uh, there's the whimsy there, the magic in them, and the rigor, like the real, kind of a really, they're both really important colorists. And uh, um, I remember, and I showed, uh, Julie showed at Garnet Press for a number of years. The time she was doing these kind of, she'd, uh, she'd gesso paper, cardboard, and then she was doing silver prints, and then they'd have small kind of biomorphic forms that were in pastels. They were unlike anything uh, I'd seen before. And I think that, uh, you know, some of my biases against uh, abstraction were, uh, were kind of pulled apart by Julie's work because I realized there's a whole universe of things that you could be doing with it. And she's, like Paul Clay, has gone back and forth between the divide of doing totally abstract pieces and pieces with images in them. The collaborative uh, decision-making was so much fun. In, in my group, there was Francisco and, and Andy Fable, 
and Libby and me. And so I thought that was great because Libby had started much earlier than me and she was in litho. So, and she did screen and litho. So we kind of never worked in the same area at the same time, but we got very friendly. But she had memory of artists that, that I didn't. And, um, and Francisco came at it from, you know, a total openness because he's very knowledgeable about contemporary art. But some of the artists from the 80s, he, he wasn't aware of, but he was, I love his enthusiasm, <laughs> he's great. And Andy also has a huge knowledge of, of the art community in Toronto and, and beyond. And he was very active in it and, and brought a knowledge that, that, uh, that nobody else had. So I think together, it was really a, a good group of people with knowledge bases in, in, you know, not overlapping, but not exclusively the same. So, and, and we loved the same things, which was great. You know, I, I wasn't sure that was gonna happen, but it did. So it was really fun. And to have someone who really loved a piece and the others didn't, having to defend that work and why is this important. I thought that was really, really wonderful and useful. I loved the whole process.